So, hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shelly Simana. I'm a visiting researcher here at Harvard Law School. Uh, I will moderate the second uh, session on uh, ordeals and efficiency. And in this panel, we have incredible three speakers, um, Shari Eric, um, Erickson, sorry, um, Elizabeth Emmons, and Kristen um, Underhill. And without further ado, I will invite the first speaker, Shari. Yeah. No, I don't. I could, but I don't. <laughs> Hi, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm with the American College of Physicians. And um, just a little bit of background on who that is. It's an organization that represents um, 152,000 um, physicians in internal medicine. So um, the, the mix of physicians as part of our organization are um, uh, primary care as well as subspecialists in a number of different internal medicine fields. And my role, I work in our public policy area as well as governmental affairs and also helping support our practices to implement um, strategies around um, improving uh, their, their daily lives, so to speak. And so um, what one of the things that the reason why I'm here, I think, is um, one of the areas that um, ACP was really interested in is this um, issue around administrative tasks. And we use the tasks on the term tasks on purpose um, because there are many tasks that may not be burdens, while many of them are. And so we, we really were um, very deliberate in the choice of that terminology because of the many of the issues we're talking about here. There are some areas where there may be a need for certain extra steps to take place. And uh, or even if those extra steps are taking place, they may not. They could probably be done quite a bit better. Um, so recently, we actually published a paper that was called "Putting Patients First by Reducing Administrative Tasks in Healthcare," and the paper really took um, an approach of sort of a more of an analytical approach around this. So on a daily basis, I hear from physicians across the country who are facing administrative tasks or burdens um, quite a bit. And what we will still do and often have done in the past is go and see what we can do to address that type of an issue. And it felt very much um, like we were just sort of hitting, hitting that one issue and not really cutting across all of the other issues that many of our members were facing. So we wanted to develop this framework around it. And really, um, what we identified in the research that we did, and we did really a scoping literature review to particularly look at the impacts of these tasks on uh, physicians and their practices, and identified that there are really a couple of different source areas for administrative tasks. Probably the most obvious area is external to a physician practice or, an, or a healthcare entity, and then there are some even within a, a practice um, or within uh, one's own team that can also be a source of um, additional administrative tasks. And then, um, and I'll talk about each one of these just very briefly. Then we also then thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe, just maybe, we don't, it's not a bunch of people in a room thinking, how much can I drive physicians crazy on any given day? Um, I'd like to think it's not that, although one could argue that there is some of that there. Um, and so we thought, well, let's see, what are the intention, what's the intent behind these tasks that many of our members are facing? Things like, um, just as examples um, that we, you know, some of which have come out um, uh, through some of the discussion, uh, prior authorizations for certain meds or pushing uh, patients perhaps through some sort of step therapies that may or may not be clinically appropriate for that patient. Um, other things like um, uh, reporting on quality measures uh, for, you know, what, that may or may not, uh, the measures may or may not really be valuable um, or clinically appropriate measures necessarily. Variety of issues like that. So what, why are these things here? Well, there are a few different intents, I guess, that we really broke this down into, and one of which is there are many entities out there that are selling products and services. And that actually even includes the physician practice themselves. They are providing services to their uh, patients. And, and so um, another really uh, key area are, is quality and safety. So one could argue that the reason why um, physicians and their practices need to report on quality measures is to ensure that they're <coughs> providing high quality care. One could argue whether they're really quality measures or if they're really performance measures. Um, there is a distinction I like to note. Um, and I think that um, um, 
but but that's really I think broadly the intent there and getting at what I'd brought up earlier is trying to actually get to a place where we are um, really looking at the true quality and outcomes of uh, the care that's being provided to patients versus um, the volume of services that currently is incentivized. Um, there's also an intent by many, um, uh, governments included, to reduce um, cost and reduce fraud. There is fraud out there for sure. We, and, and so there, there is a need to look at that. That does add quite a bit of cost to the system. And then um, another area is really financial security of the institutions themselves. So going beyond fraud and, and uh, cost, the, uh, most entities that are involved in providing in, um, uh, as a source of administrative tasks, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, have an interest in their own financial security. And then some of them really don't have a clear intent. Maybe there's something that's just been in place for a while, and that's just the way it's been done. And I mean, quite frankly, those are the types of things that really do need to go away. And jumping back for a moment on the external sources that we identified, I mean, this these are probably pretty obvious. You know, you have your public and private payers out there. We talked about that a little bit earlier. You have government entities and oversight that are involved, um, oversight by private entities, those that are doing accreditation, et cetera, of entities. Uh, vendors and suppliers, lots of um, folks like to talk about EHR vendors, electronic health record vendors, as a, as a, six, a source of administrative burden. Other health care organizations, when you're interacting across other systems or practices, there can be a lot of burden there with regard to referrals, et cetera. And then, as I mentioned, measurement, uh, measurement overall, but even measurement of um, patient experience and evolving customer experience, so to speak, with the system can uh, layer in uh, uh, tasks that may or may not be burdensome. And I talked about some of the intents. I would say one of the key things we looked at was the impact. So we did a pretty scoping uh, literature review, um, trying to understand how much this impacts uh, physicians, patients, and the system overall. And one of the key areas, which is probably the most obvious, is that uh, clinician and staff time, um, when they're dealing with billing and insurance-related activities, um, it can be three to five hours per week. Um, which actually then adds up to, if you're really looking at a full-time equivalent physician um, for a practice, uh, $68,000 to $85,000 per year per full-time physician that, um, that can be attributed to the time, uh, the cost that's associated with the time that's used there. Particularly quality measurement and reporting actually in some studies have been reported to be up to 15 hours a week of work. That's not seeing patients, that's reporting. Um, you know, and with regard to health IT or electronic health records, every hour, a study more recently, every hour spent with a patient um, has been shown to lead to two um, hours on the EHR or other desk work associated with caring for that patient. Um, prior authorizations alone, jumping to cost for a moment, may cost, based on some studies, around $3,000 per year per physician. That's a lot of... Um, uh, uh, financial impact within the system. And in fact, if another study that looked at US relative to Canada, if US physicians had administrative costs similar to those in Ontario, the total savings actually um, would be approximately 27.6 billion per year. Um, so some of the other things, we actually did also to really try to look at the impact more on patient care, because there's obvious, um, I would say, translation to impact on patient care, but where, where's the data? Where's, um, what are we talking about? And quite frankly, there's not a lot out there. This hasn't been studied to a point where we can better understand this. Um, and that's one of the recommendations, quite frankly, we've called for. But a 2013 nationwide study, um, a survey of residents found that 73% of residents reported um, that compromises in patient care due to documentation requirements. Um, another time motion study of hospitalists found that they spend more time reviewing and documenting EHRs and interacting with patients. So I think we have some clear, you know, at least um, leading indicators that could get us to understanding that better. Um, the other thing which um, is huge and it was brought up earlier is burnout. Uh, burnout um, is actually becoming more and more prevalent among physicians, and it's more so than with uh, other U.S. workers and is increasing. And it's caused by a variety of factors, but some of the research out there does indicate a linkage to the administrative tasks that physicians are faced with. 
Um, so some of the things that we came up with, and I know I'm almost out of time, um, is that, you know, when we're you're talking about what do we do about this? Well, I mean, I think that there's a, a clear need for those who are developing, <laughs> implementing uh, administrative tasks should really look at, like, for instance, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's who most, a big payer for most of the um, members of my organization. When a new reporting program or a new um, a requirement comes up, there's no thought, quite frankly, to the frontline clinician's perspective and how much that actually would add into financial time and quality of care impact. Um, you know, that, that really should be part of the consideration when they're thinking about doing this. There's obviously an intent that may actually be an okay intent. But if you're implementing it in such a way that's not actually getting us anywhere and, and adding ordeals for both the physician as well as for the patient, then we need to be more thoughtful about layering these in while still intending to meet or still working towards meeting the intention. Um, there are quite a few tasks that probably can be eliminated. Um, and if they can't be, then we need to start to look at those, regularly review them, revise them, and align them. And then... Um, I mean, a key component is really getting this input from the frontline clinicians, from the frontline, from the patients, and um, ensuring that we can better um, streamline and um, uh, across any of the existing ones, but also related even to performance measures. I think there's a, a, a lot of... Um, interest, obviously, in moving towards value-based payment, and that's something I... I agree we need to get there. We need to get out of this sort of churning of fee-for-service. But our measures really aren't there yet. They're better than they used to be, but they aren't there yet. So how can we figure out how to work toward collaboration of the frontline clinicians with those that are developing the measures? And there's some of that, but not quite good enough, quite frankly, <coughs> in order to be sure that we're actually getting at better quality for the patients so that even if they have to wait in a line, for instance, or if they have to wait to get in, that they know that the quality of care that they're getting um, is better, perhaps, than the next door neighbor. Um, and then um, we need to really make better use of existing health IT. I mean, EHRs were designed um, really with payment in mind and not with frontline clinician um, input in mind. And um, so... I'll stop there. Uh, the one last thing is I think we need a, quite a bit more rigorous research in this area to really understand the impact of administrative tasks. We can kind of get at the money. We can kind of get at the hours spent. But we really can't better understand how it's impacting patients. And I think that's the kind of impact that we need to be able to articulate better to those stakeholders involved in sort of in having um, in implementing or in, who are uh, really uh, putting in place some of the administrative tasks. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Sherry. It was fascinating. Um, I invite um, Elizabeth to, to be the second. Uh... So for the past several years, I've been studying the office work of life, or what I call life admin, by which I mean all of the managerial and secretarial type labor that it takes to run a life and a household, uh, from financial decision making to uh, meal planning to scheduling of appointments, uh, ordering supplies. Um, one source of life admin faced by uh, individuals is our topic here today, uh, ordeals, uh, or rationing by hassle, as it's sometimes called, particularly in healthcare. Uh, I usually begin talking about life admin uh, by saying that the subject is something that most people think is both trivial and boring, um, and what could be worse to listen to me talk about. Uh, I know in this room that no one needs to be convinced uh, that minor impositions on our time and energy are uh, neither trivial nor boring. Uh, it's part of my research I've conducted interviews and uh, focus groups to understand the texture of this work in people's lives, um, nearly all in the US. My initial point of entry for this project was the distribution of this work within households, uh, particularly uh, between spouses, but I swiftly became interested in the question of how anyone makes time for what I'm calling life admin uh, or just admin uh, these days, uh, in an age of technologies that can reach us more immediately, uh, and in the face of expectations that we respond ever more quickly, this life admin place demands uh, that many people feel uh, quite acutely. Uh, I published an article about this life admin, uh, and now I'm finishing a book on it. Um, 
I'm working at the moment on thinking about an article on the relationship between life admin um, and uh, disability discrimination uh, in particular. I'm gonna raise a series of questions uh, related particularly to social attitudes and uh, stigma, um, as well as differential impact, uh, especially for people uh, with disabilities um, and the matter of ordeals. Starting with uh, some questions about the social model of disability. Uh, so a central idea in the disability rights movement has been to contrast the so-called medical model of disability with the social model of disability. The idea there being to point out that most people think of disability as an individual medical problem. This is what gets referred to as the medical model. But the social model suggests instead that disability inheres in the interaction between impairment and the surrounding social environment. Uh, what people often mean uh, when they talk about the social model disability is the surrounding physical environment. Uh, so uh, a classic formulation of the social model comes from uh, Simi Linton, who uses a wheelchair, and she says, if I want to vote or use the library and these places are inaccessible, do I need a doctor or a lawyer? By which she means to say, right, is my problem a medical problem that needs a medical cure, or is it a social problem that needs a, a legal fix? Uh, and in her case, uh, the changing the environment is the only option. So this is a formulation of the social model of disability. So when people talk about the social model and they talk about that surrounding environment that makes up part of what is disability, they're often talking about the surrounding physical environment, inaccessibility, or the surrounding discriminatory attitudes that limit a person with a disability. I'm interested in how paperwork or other medical or deals or other kinds of admin hassles can be a meaningful part of the burden of living with a disability, can in some sense define what disability is for someone. So as a young woman I interviewed uh, said, who um, has uh, cerebral palsy, she said, people think impairments like cerebral palsy are limiting, but to me, quote, a lot of it is bureaucracy, not really disability. She talked about uh, the ways that uh, she can type, but she can't write, so any paperwork requires finding someone to do the writing for her, and transportation involves booking an accessoride van and then dealing with the many ways that they mess up. She says, when I go to the doctor's, appoint a doctor's office, the appointment can take like 15 minutes, but it can take the whole day. A lot of it is bureaucracy, not really disability. So her lines exemplify right, what I mean about this social model of disability uh, as opposed to the medical model as it pertains to something like ordeals. Um, the cost of this life admin, though, is not only time and energy, it's social attitudes or stigma. So people in my interviewee's situation worry about being viewed as an unreliable worker, as someone whose disability makes her not appealing to hire. Uh, she, in fact, had been having a very hard time getting a job. Um, so one question is this. What do we do about the way that ordeals might add to the stigma of disability? by making life with a disability more onerous in ways that outsiders might attribute to the disability itself. Now this could be asked also about people facing any kind of disadvantage, including poverty or, or race-based disadvantage. Or deals may add not only to wasting someone's time, time that might be spent on education or trying to get a job or, um, or something else, but ordeals, ordeals may also add to the stereotypes or stigma associated with that person's social identity. Uh, are there any ways to address that problem in the design or delivery of ordeals? A few other questions. One about which disabilities? So think about the impact of ordeals on people with disabilities, we may need to get more fine-grained, right, and ask which disabilities are likely to intersect with ordeals and in which ways. Uh, Several people I interviewed talked about the particular challenges of applying for and retaining subsidized Section 8 housing. Uh, the way that not checking your mail for a week might mean losing your housing or ending up in some endless appeals process. Um, hmm. We might ask, right, which disabilities might affect someone's ability to compete in an ordeal? Uh, for the allocation of some scarce resource like housing or, say, healthcare here. Um, so someone with paraplegia who uses a wheelchair might be well-equipped uh, to compete in an ordeal if it's done online. Um, 
or for, but for a person who's blind, whether the website follows some kind of accessibility guidelines, right, might matter. With someone with depression, an example, right, that uh, Nir and Paul and Chris raise, um, hard to see how that ordeal is ever going to be anything but an obstacle. Um, but we might think about whether there is assistance that could help in the context of, say, depression. Maybe personal assistance, individual assistance is what's needed there. Uh, so there's a study that shows that, uh, and this is outside the context of disability, this is about uh, poverty-related disadvantage, but that uh, personal assistance from representatives at H&R Block with filling out the federal financial aid form, the FAFSA, helps students get into college, go to college, and stay in college. So just having that assistance with completing the form, this very long form, uh, <laughs> helps people move forward. Maybe there are contexts in which, with regard to certain disabilities, personal assistance matters as opposed to another form of design. Uh, um, another question, how do affective states vary in ways that might matter? What's the feeling of dealing with which kinds of ordeals? Um, What's the affective state? What's the associated utility or disutility? And how might it be different for different people? People I interviewed discussed the humiliation of some kinds of uh, admin, for instance, of poverty admin or disability admin. Uh, one interesting question is, what kinds of interactions take the greatest toll and on whom? Uh, uh, near your article seems to assume that describing your medical condition and defending it could be is more humiliating than needing to fill out forms or take various other kinds of time-consuming uh, steps. And that might be the case, right? There might be a privacy dimension and there might be an element of having to speak about uh, your disability um, that is more, uh, more problematic. Um, but it might be different depending on the medical condition. Uh, so it might matter whether or not you have something that is a recognized condition. Uh, like cancer, than for people who might suffer from invisible disabilities. Or depending on the kinds of interactions, the tenor of the interactions that one has in an ordeal might also shape uh, the impact uh, of that uh, ordeal and on whom. Um, and it also, might affect, it also might be affected by the kind of quantity of uh, admin, how much that particular person is going through at that life juncture. Uh, this one might also be relevant to how we estimate the kind of impact of a particular ordeal. And lastly, I wanted to raise a question about impact, about disparate impact uh, of ordeals. Uh, some of you may know this uh, study of um, wait times uh, in blood donation uh, from Australia, Ashley Craig and, and colleagues, that shows that there's this gender difference in the elasticity of wait times, so that uh, women are um, unaffected by a longer wait time to give blood, whereas men are more likely to decline to give blood because there's a longer wait time. So might it be the case, so we'd need to generalize from this study and then say that perhaps there are similar impacts along lines of race or disability. The race data is mixed uh, that I have seen. But let's just posit that there is uh, a differential impact of wait times and that, in fact, women, say, are more likely to wait. It might be, then, that an ordeal funnels the service delivery to women to a greater extent, but at the cost of imposing right, an ordeal uh, on them. Um, if it did turn out that was true, right, how would we think about that question, about imposing that uh, opportunity cost uh, on uh, the women who are then going to get <coughs> the benefits funneled, funneled in their direction to a greater extent? And then moving back to my question about social attitudes and stigma, right, how should we think about any kind of increased stigma that might accompany people <laughs> in those groups being less available for other more highly valued activities because of their time now being consumed by the life admin of ordeals. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, I now invite uh, our last uh, speaker, Kristen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. <clears throat> um, so the research that I do focuses on structural influences on behavior, and particularly the influence of law. Um, I've been very interested in incentive-based policies and motivation. 
Um, I'm very much enamored with expressive theories of law that look at systemic features such as legal arrangements as signals that communicate information to people. And that's very much the lens of a lot of my work. Um, and I've lately been doing quite a bit of research on Medicaid Section 1115 waivers, which are state by state experimental programs that change features of the Medicaid program for people who are beneficiaries in that state. So I want to begin these remarks with a descriptive point on places where I'm seeing ordeals showing up in that work or things that we could understand to be ordeals. And then I'd like to make a series of what looks, I think, five conceptual points of different observations in light of the efficiency goals that we're thinking about as part of this panel. So as a descriptive point, um, in the Medicaid program currently, we're looking at a raft of new requirements in Medicaid waivers that move the focus away from ordeals as ways of triaging coverage for particular interventions, such as what we've been talking about already with coverage for care, co uh, with access to things like bed nets. Um, but instead, in, in this context, we're looking at requirements that in fact structure access to participation in insurance at all all um, and in public benefits. And these requirements can be, as I mentioned, interpreted as ordeals. Um, we see this very clearly in Medicaid with trends towards increasing the frequency of redetermination paperwork, um, increasing proof of citizenship, and uses of some of these new policy innovations that resemble what we've seen in food stamps and cash welfare. So SNAP and TANF, with requirements such as community engagement, such as volunteering school or work as a condition of maintaining Medicaid el eligibility, um, completion of preconditions for some benefits and increased premium payments. Um, so all of these come with ordeals. They come with paperwork requirements. Even if you're meeting these conditions, you need to certify that you're meeting them. Um, and it's moving away from a prior trend towards streamlining Medicaid eligibility enrollment, or at least a divergence between states that are maintaining streamlining or po populations <coughs> that have streamlined access and states and populations that do not. So there's different ways to think about these ordeals. Um, and people talk about them differently. So one is that you're using healthcare as an incentive to get people to do things that are good for them anyway, um, like volunteering, social participation, and work. Another way is to get people to sink some costs into their care. So putting skin in the game um, such that they will use their care as a more valuable resource and they may use it more um, in, in kind of the ways that would be optimal. A third way is to consider it as identifying the people who place the highest value on it, so more of a selection mechanism. And the fourth, and some people talk about this, is looking at these requirements as separating out moral dessert. So similar to the trial by ordeal that we were hearing about uh, just now with the, um, with the older, uh, very older uh, methods of criminal trials. So, I, I think that it's interesting to look at how different people talk about this and how different populations are going to be experiencing these new requirements, and it's really important to study these carefully. So the conceptual points that I wanted to make in light of these efficiency goals, um, first, of course, I don't need to tell anyone here this, ordeals carry administrative costs, and these are not well quantified, they are not well studied, and any study of ordeals is going to have to look at the at administrative costs of enforcement and the potentially invasive monitoring that is required um, to make sure to, to separate out people who are fulfilling the ordeals and people who are not. Um, I also wanted to make the point that when we talk about efficiency, we should be mindful that what we consider to be waste depends on what we see to be the salient goals of the system. So efficiency in terms of cost benefit analysis or qualities gained is not the only systemic goal that you might consider. Um, unused eyeglasses, to take an example from the paper by Nir and, and Chris and Paul, um, is one potential example of waste. But maybe handing out eyeglasses to everyone who qualifies is a means of serving equity. Um, or another way to think about it, if we're talking about Medicaid, people who are in Medicaid but not using those benefits, you could think about it as waste. But it might also serve other goals, such as providing coverage in the events of emergency, such as providing 
a system of social solidarity in which people can all, in which every person can expect coverage, um, providing a measure of financial security, just people knowing that they are protected against potential uh, unexpected medical costs, even if they're not using those benefits right now. These are all alternative goals that we could think about in the design of a system, even if it's not strictly cost benefit efficiency. Um, I want to think a little bit and raise a few questions about ordeals as expressive, about what it signals to people who are going through ordeals, about the extent to which they are valued, their time is valued, and in the case of health insurance, the extent to which their life is valued, because everybody, no one is going to bat for something that they do not think they need. Um, so a point that I've seen in my other research is that people supply their own informations for the processes, their, their own explanations for the processes that they're going through. Um, when people are offered an incentive to do something, they tell stories to themselves. If no one explains to them why this incentive is there and why this activity is necessary or valuable, people will supply their own informations. And in ordeals, people are going to come to conclusions about the extent to which the manager of the ordeal, the ordeal architect, is valuing themselves, their ability, their lives, and their time. Um, this can be extremely costly in terms of motivation, in terms of trust. Um, perceived violations of reciprocity uh, occur sometimes in the in incentive context and probably would be augmented in the ideal context. Um, and this, I think, underlies this expression of how much the ordeal architect values you, how much your insurer values you, or whoever it is that's setting this gauntlet for you. Um, I think it's it's important to, to identify more about how people interpret that and how they use information coming along with the ordeal to, to make those interpretations. So one thing I'd be really interested in studying with ordeals is when you give people interpretive frames to understand the ordeal that they're going through, does it make a difference? Um, people who know that they're in the NHS, who know that resources are scarce and they're supposed to wait for their surgery because everybody gets it on the same footing, might have a really different experience from what we do in the US when our insurance insurance company requires pre-authorization. We don't perceive ordeals as rationing. That's the first thing that we've seen in some of these, pa these papers is an acknowledgment that ordeals are rationing. Um, but we don't perceive them that way. We see it as bad faith or penny pinching by our insurance companies. Um, I think ordeals in the Medicaid context are being perceived um, in a number of different sense-making ways. Um, so making sure that we take that into account when we're evaluating ordeals. Another observation that I had is that, you know, of course, and this is, this is a, a clear point, but the reasons why people fail to complete the ordeals become the, the metrics by which we ration those, uh, those goods. And so ideally, you know, you would want this to ration on the, to, uh, on the basis of whether the care is important. Um, and this, we use proxies for that, proxies for that value. Um, the proxy is the extent to which people themselves value getting that. How, how motivated are they? How inclined are they? How much do they intend to use the thing that they're getting? Um, but that motivation and perception of value and intent to use something is all situated within these social determinants of both both health and these psychosocial factors. Um, so we have a number of social determinants of health that are affecting both our needs and our ability to go through the ordeals necessary to get care. Um, and this is particularly problematic when we talk about um, when we talk about people who face ordeals in many different areas of their lives, and of course this is the regressive point that keeps coming up, but people who don't complete ordeals because of fatalism or fatigue, lack of knowledge, alienation, social isol isolation, lack of emphasis on self-care, um, all of these flow from structural determinants. They're not simply indicators of moral desert. And so when those become the metrics on which we ration. Um, I, I think that we have not potentially looked far enough in luck egalitarianism to recognize those attributes as, as socially determined just as much as um, underlying health status. So I think, um, I think it's important to, to be attentive to people's bandwidth for ordeals. And I, I'm very interested in, in Liz's points as well on how this may have a disparate impact on some groups. And finally, I think the focus on ordeals, and again, many people will have thought of this too, um, the focus on 
on capturing efficiency gains here obscures the structural problems in the system. That there is scarcity here because we have decided that there is scarcity here, or because we've decided that we are okay with the path dependency that brought us to this particular system of healthcare organization. Um, that, you know, when we think about where we should be recouping costs in the healthcare system, um, the costs are high in large part, you know, not only, but in large part for supply side problems with payment fragmentation, delivery fragmentation, <coughs> lack of coordinated care, um, and our unwillingness to have harder societal conversations about where rationing is necessary. And so looking at whether these ordeals will reach those problems, um, I think is also an important conversation to have. And I get the sense that a lot of these ordeals are only reaching kind of small potatoes costs and there are bigger efficiency gains elsewhere in the system, which is not to say we shouldn't talk about this, but there are, there are bigger questions here too. So I'm over time, I will see the floor. <laughs> so thank you for our speaker for raising uh, such important um, issues in this um, topic. Um, and now we would like to open it for a discussion. Any of our panelists would like to comment? Yeah. Well, it was interesting to hear uh, the uh, invocation of law. Uh, it, it was interesting to hear the invocation of law mm -hmm. as a system of ordeals uh, because uh, that became quite uh, prominent to me and I looked up a famous case in which a dissenting opinion says, it is certainly a rational argument that payment of some minimal poll, poll tax promotes civic responsibility, weeding out those who do not care enough about public affairs to pay $1.50 or thereabouts a year for the exercise of the franchise. Uh, an ordeal, right? Uh, the dollar and 50 cents is probably more expensive to administer than the uh, revenue it brings in. Uh, but it is justified here as eliciting information and weeding out those who do not care enough uh, to pay it. Uh, that was a dissenting opinion and in fact, as we all know, poll taxes are unconstitutional. Uh, so it was held in this case, 1966. Uh, and uh, that argument was rejected. This is not. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I do want us to um, kind of uh, make sure that we are um, in our discussions, which are very interdisciplinary. We had a you know a, um, a sociologist and a, a legal thinker and uh, um, another social scientist. Uh, uh, speak and before we had philosophers, I want us to make sure that we do bear in mind also some potential for kind of real world application as we discuss this. So I'll basically, in a way, addressing a question from the uh, audience uh, from the previous uh, session. I'll mention two potential uses for a deal that I think are not inconceivable and um, might uh, be readier candidates for um, introduction than uh, others in a US context. Uh, so Alan, research by Alan Garber, the provost, and also different research by the Commonwealth Fund uh, showed correlation between the what is generally seen as excessive use of specialists in this country compared to the UK and uh, the easiness in which one can, the basically the short time, uh, so not just a financial issue, the short time in which one can reach a specialist in this country, um, one could potentially make the case that uh, if things were harder, the system overall would have been more efficient. Of course, many patients who are now seeking a specialist would be much aggravated by this, but that doesn't mean that they are right. 
Another is um, in the <coughs> government of how electronic health record management would be used in the clinic. Uh, sometimes people are floating ideas such as if you want to prescribe a brand name drug which is expensive, you will need to scroll through more screens than if you uh, want to uh, prescribe uh, the generic that the system wants to encourage you in most cases with some judgment to you um, to prescribe. Uh, this need not be done through adding net tasks. It sometimes will be a case in which we need to decide what will be at the bottom of the very of the list. And the ordeal uh, approach would be don't just make the uh, screen harder to use, given that it's going to be somewhat hard to use uh, for some of the medications, put some of them at the bottom. So just to throw, throw in uh, uh, two possibilities there. Thank you. Any other comment? I'm yes. I'm not sure how I use this. Um, so this is just following on near. Um, I'm going to give a couple of other ordeals. Um, one ordeal which I'm routinely subject to is I write to my primary care physician and I say, my back hurts, my leg hurts, my whatever else it is. And he invariably says, sometimes I've gone in because it's so painful, he invariably says, wait two weeks, and if it's not better, I'll send you to a specialist. My guess is we've all had this experience. And he knows that some large percentage of the time it will get better and you don't have to see the specialist. But when I do, I will have suffered two weeks of pain that you don't need. Um, I've recently done research on the astronomically high cost uh, of about 15 drugs under Medicare, Part D. These drugs, which cost something like, you know, frequently cost $15,000 a year, um, are responsible for more than 30% of what we spend on Medicare Part D. I want to go further than Nier did. I would like to say that a physician, in order to prescribe one of these drugs, should have to write some sort of justification that might take 20 minutes or even a half an hour to prescribe a drug to somebody that's going to cost us $15,000 a year. That means that he or she thinks that his patient or her, uh, or her patient really needs the drug. It's one of the ways we're, we're going to curtail the use of extraordinarily high-cost drugs and maybe even bring down their prices. I want to make one other point, which is many people will say, as <coughs> Elizabeth said, well, we're talking about ordeals, but really it's small potatoes because I want a completely different medical system. And that's a legitimate thing, but that should be in a conference, I believe, on medical systems. It's at least worth worrying about the question of when, if ever, are ordeals useful given the current medical care system that we have in the United States. I believe Elizabeth, by the way, your comments were incredibly uh, creative. Oh, I'm sorry. Kristen, sorry. You put Elizabeth in the same thing. I know. I'm Kristen. You, sorry. Okay. Kristen, your comments were incredibly uh, creative, mm -hmm. but, I don't th but I do think that you were a little bit on the side of, I don't like our system, so therefore I'm going to sort of say ordeals are small potatoes. They might be small potatoes, but with a system that uses up as, you know, more than a sixth of our GMP, <coughs> any small improvement is worthwhile. Do you want to yeah, respond to that? Sure. A um, couple of things with regard to pricing in particular is it's a complex issue. And, um, and I would argue that I don't, I don't believe that it, that, first of all, they already do take 20 minutes <laughs> to uh, at least to complete those. Um, with that said, there are a few other, um, I think, areas where we could look for that. One is that, you know, in, an, in a system where we have increasing transparency around um, everything from performance metrics to um, who gets um, a $5 lunch or whatever from this um, entity, there's next to no transparency or um, information about the, what it actually costs to um, research and develop the drugs that are costing that much money. Um, and with that said, I would say that so there's some areas um, of uh, pricing and cost that um, need to be addressed outside of the physician's office. 
um, before it land, all lands there because it all does land there at this point. Um, it also lands on the patient because the patient then has to wait because it, um, the way it's structured is that it takes some time for those to go through and they will get rejected and then it takes a second time for those to go through. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I think having some things in place where, you know, it's not necessarily the first choice, um, so to speak, and that's what step therapy really is. It's sort of stepping um, physician or you know patients through a variety of therapies to land in whichever one makes is most appropriate from the generic to perhaps a more expensive therapy. In some cases that's extremely appropriate. In other cases it absolutely is not clinically appropriate. But there's no real um, uh, uh, taking into account of, of that in the process, whereas if you actually had, and this then jumping to electronic health records, there's another component there, right? So um, there's not enough, um, because the systems are really designed for um, payment um, and, and prevent fraud prevention in many ways, um, there's not really actually a good useful um, for the, at the point of care in terms of workflows um, for the within a clinician practice or for a patient um, coming through the clinician practice there's not really um, there's there's it's all set up to um, it's, it's not really set up to, to work with that so they can't they don't have the information they need at the point of care to be able to um, effectively uh, do some decision making uh, around choices of physician, uh, choices of medications, or choices of alternative therapies because they don't they don't even know how much they cost. I mean, some of them they are pretty obvious. Like some of them are you know hit the hit the news, but um, often they don't. And part of that then again, the other layer in there is is through um, the payers. So you can kind of have a sense for Medicare, kind of. <coughs> But you actually may not even know if a patient's coming into the office um, based on their card, if they're in Medicare Advantage or traditional Medicare, not necessarily. Um, so Medicare Advantage are private plans. So then you have different benefit structures within those. And you know, then obviously layering in another complication of patients that are sort of your traditional Part B Medicare, but also have a supplemental plan. There's no really um, good way for them to know how much this actually costs the patients, and that's another area where we don't have any transparency around that. There's no really good way to know that. So I would just argue that there are a number of other entities that are involved that are impacting um, the ordeals that, um, quite frankly, are um, largely felt at that point of care or immediately after by both the physician and the patient and the cl other clinicians, the team, I should say, um, th that um, really in our, in our market-based system, um, there's not really a lot of um, accountability beyond those aspects. So that's where the accountability lands. Thank you. So we'll start taking questions from the audience as well. So is there? Well, people come to the microphone. Yeah. Do. Uh, I, I, di I do want to hear a response from Richard, if possible. As, well, you're an economist. Surely you think that something like burnout, people leaving the profession, is a cost that should somehow be taken into account. How, how should we be thinking about the kind of I, I where, where does that terrible, cost come in? I don't think that. So, so if basically, if, I'm so, suppose when we talk about these drugs, the 20 minutes is totally worth uh, maybe, the cost of the drug, be, but if the 20 minutes First place, there are only 15 of these drugs that cost more than $1,000 a month. Right. There are no, it's Medicare Part D, it's not Medicare Advantage. Um, I don't believe that this is a, would be a major portion of burnout. I mean, I believe we do have an incredible number of rules and regulations and forms that doctors have to fill out. I don't think of them, they're ordeals in one sense of an ordeal. Anything that you have to do that's really hard is an ordeal. Anytime I have to clean up my office, that's an ordeal. But it's not a dead weight loss. Indeed, most people would say it was probably a benefit. So I think that the people who have imposed these restrictions on physicians aren't doing it because they're trying to sort physicians, which is what I thought the our concept of ordeals was. They're doing it because they think they're preventing fraud or controlling costs or providing better medical information or whatever else it is. So I don't think that you should attribute burnout to what near and unders would call ordeals. I don't think we're trying to impose burdens on physicians to do that. I do think that we do impose some burdens on physicians, for example, in their training, to sort them out. I think that that's a different type of ordeal. I, as a specialist in such and such, don't want to have too many of those specialists. We do the same thing in higher education. 
when we make people, you know, <coughs> get excessive degrees, publish papers that shouldn't be published so that they can get promoted. Yes. Hi, my name's Catherine Young. I'm a law professor at Boston College, and I've done uh, quite a bit of research on tensions between queuing and rights. And my question really goes to Elizabeth and also to Kristen. It's really fascinating, both of your talks. Thank you. Um, I was very interested in the idea uh, that Elizabeth Emmons talked about of people competing in their ordeals. That is, those who are impacted by or an ordeal are actually competing against others who are facing the same ordeals. And in my research, I saw a lot of people trying to alleviate queuing by uh, under the table payments, um, corruption, or litigation, litigating for their rights. Um, and one of the effects I saw with this was that in a lot of these, I guess, queuing ordeals, uh, there seemed to be a generation of very anti solidarastic elements. Um, so people within a queue together, you would think would be a collective, would be very concerned about the ordeals they're facing, but in fact they were splintered, they were fixated on the ordeal, but not so concerned with you know, the structural problems of the system um, and very concerned by those who saw as queue jumping, you know, getting their benefit before them. So I wondered if in, in your research you'd seen kind of similar trends of this kind of enmity generated by the, by the ordeal itself. Um, I don't have um, I don't have evidence of that, but I, I the kinds of questions I was asking I don't think would elicit that. What you're describing is is really interesting though and makes me wonder if it's shaped by I'd be interested to know more about about your research to know how much that outcome is shaped by whether the people are face to face ever. In, in their ordeal or if they're, you know, remote and online, you know, so in this, um, uh, in one of the studies, um, I think, coming out of um, uh, Indonesia on ordeals, looking at uh, queuing behavior, they found that the people who all had to be in a queue for many hours together sorted out amongst themselves a mechanism for giving, you know, taking numbers um, and then getting in touch with the person who was supposed to be later, right? So they found, a, and this was, you know, the researchers discussed this, right, as a, a kind of concern that you may not be able to make your ordeal work effectively because the people involved will collaborate, but they're only going to collaborate if they actually are face to face with each other. And so I wonder, um, maybe we can talk afterwards, but I'd be interested to hear um, where you have seen this in particular. Do you want to say anything, Kristen, about that? Um, so I also, I don't have anything directly on point, but I think it's really interesting that when there is an ordeal as a, as a midpoint between, you know, many people who are similarly situated and some complete the ordeal and get the goodie and some do not, um, I think that when people are suspicious of the metric on which they're being sorted and the capacity needed to complete the ordeal, I think that will produce, a, I, I think that will produce that competitive element that you're looking at and evaluate of moral desert among different people within kind of th that were once you know considered to be similarly situated so I think yeah I'm, I'm fascinated by it too but I don't um, I don't have anything quite on point <laughs> so. hi yeah I'm Don Condi and I'm actually a practicing physician and I would guess there are not very many here um, because practicing physicians are on a treadmill and they're seeing patients <laughs> in order to attempt to make a living uh, I would certainly disagree with Dr. Seckhauser. I think uh, anything that's imposed on physicians is a burden and uh, leads to burnout. Um, the things that uh, strike me about what I've heard so far are that um, there's been very little mention of the already existing enormous disparities in healthcare. So we have enormous populations in this country that hardly get to use healthcare. Even if they have Medicaid, they don't get very good care. Uh, they don't get it for a lot of reasons. Now, I happen to work with a population of people with serious mental illness, and on average, they die 25 years earlier than the rest of us in the United States. You could say that's sufficient in the sense that they are not going to use health care for 25 more years, but it's a bit cynical. Um, and I think that talking more about racial and economic disparities would be more useful. Um, the other thing about ordeals is that 
uh, we're talking about from an ethics point of view. Um, people with Medicaid are already undergoing ordeals that no one here can understand. The average income on SSI, supplemental security income, is about $800. So four people could go to one of those Cambridge restaurants <laughs> Professor Zuck, uh, Zuckhauser is <laughs> talking about and have a nice meal for $800. One meal as opposed to one month where you're paying all of your expenses for that. So I think I would suggest that more practicing physicians should be in discussions like this because we're the ones who are actually seeing the patients. And we need to think about the people who are already suffering the most and I've heard very little mention of that. Thank you. Would anyone want to comment on? Yes. I, I could. I could oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't feel. Yeah. Thanks. I don't feel so lonely now. Uh, I I I agree uh, with those comments. I I think it's um, I think it's uh, dangerous to be too dismissive of the amount of hassles and burdens within clinical practices and that physicians are experiencing. And I think it is disproven every day and, and data are being acquired by ACP and others uh, that uh, these shapes of, of clinical practice are not adversely affecting the psyche and the practice. and duration of practice and the amount of practice of physicians. Um, the burdens involved in clinical care, if it was only 20 minutes, I was thinking, God, that would be a lot less than we now spend. Uh, for the most of the most expensive drugs, um, much more time and paperwork is involved um, and re-justification and duplicative documentation, uh, faxing to people who somehow always lose the fax the first three times it's sent, but you don't know it for another 48 hours or another 72 hours. Um, it takes enormous amount of office time and that's an expense. Um, and that expense goes up and up and it means you need personnel. Uh, it takes the physician more time. That's an expense. Uh, the medical record issues uh, are an enormous burden, not only in terms of time, cost to the medical centers, um, but because they're designed more for documentation, which is for reimbursement purposes, than they are for the flow of clinical care, um, they also, you know, have a cost for the patient uh, who doesn't receive the same amount of face time. That's well documented. And that means not as much time clearly listening to the patient and observing the patient. Um, but then there's a second set of, of, of costs to this, and that is even if we view a lot of these costs, these hassles, as illegitimate and outside what we could consider appropriate ordeals um, that might be considered empirically studied. And then the question is, how many of them are really going to lead to better outcomes? And we don't really know. Um, they are going to interact with all the legitimate ordeals that we would like to impose. And so the additive or synergistic um, uh, degree of the ordeal is going to be very different than what we intend. Um, and I think that's a risk as, as well. And it, again, is why we need better empirical information. Um, we don't, just like we don't know how much a dollar means to each individual person, we don't know how much the same ordeal means to each of our patients. So um, I, I think we have to consider uh, the, the, the ordeals that are very real, the hassles in, the, in clinical practice. Can I respond to this? Yeah. I do not, I don't want to minimize the burdens that doctors bear for all sorts of administrative requirements that, for whatever reason, we put on them. But I don't think that, unfortunately, ordeals have two meanings. One is just a big burden. And I, I apologize for those burdens. 
but they're not That's the true. ordeal that Nir and Anders and I were talking about, no. which is designed to see, I mean, for example, if we were trying to see which doctors were better able to deal with a massive amount of paperwork, work, so we're going to put them in charge of the hospital, that would have been our type of ordeal. I don't think that that's what we're trying to do. No, I, I understand that distinction. And are, are the intended ordeals or proposed intended type of ordeal that we wrote about, we considered within our definition, uh, are different than some of those hassles, or many of them, I think uh, or of them ordeals in, I in a more generic real term. ordeal, and maybe I should have said two hours I'm, I'm obviously more worried about the high cost, or five hours, right. the high cost uses of drugs. Well, um, I've done a little bit of research on it. I've talked to a lot sure. of people about it. And I think that we are profligate in our use of those. Um, but, you know, you I, have more experience. No, no, I think sometimes, know. I agree, sometimes we are. I would prefer a solution like in Australia, where they negotiated with the makers of the hepatitis C treatment. I. My student wrote the Australian Pharmaceutical Drug Plan. I wrote an article on it with him 25 years ago. Well done. It's a great plan. <laughs> but it only works for Australia because Australia is at the end of the world and doesn't develop drugs. <laughs> and as Shari told us, there are big costs in developing drugs. Australia is a free rider. That's an interesting one. Thank you very much. You. Uh, we will now go to our break. Um, 15 minutes. Thank you.